Thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure to be back in London. I always enjoy coming here. I'll be talking about the uh, clinical evidence, and Rudy will talk about the uh, regulatory and legal path. I, uh, the objectives are that you will be able to list the physical chemical properties of oat beta glucan, which influence its bioactivity on postprandial glucose and LDL cholesterol. And you'll be able to list the criteria for the oat beta glucan content of a food product, which must be fulfilled in order to make a health claim about that product. So regarding uh, LDL cholesterol, we've seen this type of a slide. This is based, this is uh, LDL reduction and percent risk of coronary heart disease from the clinical trials. So clearly very good evidence that LDL is an excellent biomarker. Reducing LDL reduces cardiovascular risk. Uh, in terms of oats and serum cholesterol lowering, meta-analyses have fairly consistently shown uh, an average effect, which is significant, but they also tend to show significant heterogeneity. In other words, different studies have different effects. Sometimes oats will lower cholesterol, sometimes it won't. And people have wondered about why that is, and none of the factors like dose or in any of the other factors have actually explained this heterogeneity. And people have wondered whether it's something to do with the physical chemical properties of the oats, the viscosity. And this has been discussed a lot, but has never actually been proven. So that was one of, well, we'll come back to that. In terms of postprandial glucose in cardiovascular disease, we have perhaps less good evidence for that. Uh, there's certainly a wealth of uh, prospective trials or uh, epidemiological kind of trials which link high postprandial glucose with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But in terms of clinical trials, the only one to date which has shown any effect is the ACOBO study, which I was pleased to be part of, uh, the STOP-NIDM trial, which took subjects with impaired glucose tolerance and showed that acrobose treatment, which is a drug which reduces postprandial glucose by inhibiting digestion of carbohydrates, reduced cardiovascular events by about 50 percent. But there weren't very many cardiovascular events, and a, and a big trial is underway to see if this can be confirmed. In terms of the ability of oat beta glucan to lower glucose, we know on the basis of studies with uh, solutions of glucose with oat beta glucan in them, that uh, depending upon the viscosity of the beta glucan, the higher the viscosity of that solution, the greater the lowering of glucose. And the things which have controlled viscosity are the molecular weight of the beta glucan and its concentration. So here is a relationship between log molecular weight times concentration on viscosity, and here is the relation of log molecular weight on peak glucose. Now this is, as I, I said, is in solutions of, of glucose. We don't know if this happens in real foods. Susan Tosh's group uh, treated the beta-glucan with beta-glucanase to reduce its molecular weight. So here we see we had two different doses, a four-gram dose, which is uh, and an eight-gram dose. We had the native, about two million. It was a high, medium, and low, so the high was about 600,000, 381, 130,000. And here was the eight-gram again. And uh, viscosity, solu solubility, interestingly, when you treat, is also affected somewhat. But if we look at the viscosity versus the log molecular weight times C, you can see this linear relationship. So here's the blood glucose responses, and you can see that both the native and the high molecular weight at a dose of four grams, uh, with about 45 grams of carbohydrate, reduced the glucose response fairly similarly, whereas once you got down to under 400,000, it was no effect and the low. Interesting, if you had a higher dose, the effect of the lower molecular weights was partly overcome by the increased amount. Uh, and when we correlated viscosity with the peak rise, very tight relationship. Uh, what about the beta-glucan, properties of beta-glucan and its influence on LDL cholesterol? And um, in order to do this, uh, we uh, decided we needed a multi-center trial and we wanted to get involved centers around the world, so we had uh, Australia involved in Sydney, we had three centers in Canada, we had uh, a center here in the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, Susan and Peter were involved in uh, measuring the cereals. And uh, here's the other clinical investigators. This was uh, managed by GI Labs, 
and our code name was Bluebird, so we have a little blue bird here. Uh, this study was published uh, last year in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and the uh, references on the abstract, which was handed out. Uh, it was funded by Cree Nutrition, by the Swedish Governmental Agency for Innovations, and by Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada. So our primary hypothesis, we had two primary hypotheses, and as such, our uh, statistical analysis was reduced. So instead of P less than 0.05, you had P less than 0.025 to account for the two primary objectives. One was that three grams of high molecular weight beta-glucan would reduce LDL cholesterol, and the other was that the LDL cholesterol lowering was related to log molecular weight times C. Well, let's start with the molecular weights first off. The high molecular weight was, these were extruded breakfast cereals. Here, as you can see, the control cereal was a wheat fiber cereal. The amounts of fiber, the amounts of beta-glucan, we had either three or four grams, and the amount of total fiber was about five to eight grams. The amount of the control fiber was matched to the, the high, the, th the three grams of high molecular weight uh, there. And the amount of fiber which was needed to be consumed per day was 20 to 30 grams. And this was fed in, in uh, divided doses twice daily. So they were packaged in uh, double-blind fashion like this with a code. Subjects were asked to have one package with breakfast and one with another meal during the day. And so we uh, stratified subjects. We wanted people with a moderately high LDL between three and five, stratified into low and high levels. And the uh, power analysis suggested we needed 81 subjects for the control on the high molecular weight arm and 64 for the other arms. And so uh, there was, um, that was the design of the trial. And it ran for four weeks, so it wasn't very long, but it was sort of a proof of concept study. So here's the, uh, here's the flow chart uh, of the most of the people who were excluded were, did not meet the inclusion criteria regarding their blood lipids and so on. And so we were successful in, in randomizing all of the people we wanted. And the analysis I'm showing you is an intent to treat analysis with all of the data there. There were only 6% dropouts. And if we replace the data with the last value forward, it didn't make any difference at all. Or if we replaced it with zero, it didn't, with, the, with the baseline, it didn't make any difference to the conclusions. Okay, so we had about 45% uh, men. We had 50-50 on the two strata, about 80% Caucasian. And you can see these are middle-aged people spanning the entire range of lean through virtually morbidly obese. Under 40 was our cut point on BMI. Uh, dietary intake, I'm just pointing out that on the treatments, there was a little bit less polyunsaturated fat, more protein, and more fiber, as we would expect. <clears throat> these differences between the five treatment arms were not significant. So all of the arms showed these changes, uh, and they were balanced. So our first hypothesis was that three grams of high molecular weight beta-glucan lowers LDL. This was analyzed. Just, the two, just these two treatment groups were compared with analysis of covariance. There was no significant effect of age, sex, center, body mass index, waist circumference, or any interactions with the effects. The only significant thing which, de which was related to the cholesterol at the end of the study, LDL at the end of the study, was the baseline and the stratum, and of course, the treatment. So this just illustrates baseline versus four weeks. The uh, red circles are the control, the green circles are the test, and the difference between the lines represents the treatment effect. Uh, highly significant. There was no interaction between uh, these things. So in other words, the lines are parallel, and the difference is 0.21 or 5.5%. The second hypothesis with LDL cholesterol lowering would be related to log molecular weight times C. This was assessed by including log molecular weight times C into the analysis of covariance. Again, there was no significant effect of age, sex, center, waist circumference, or BMI. Uh, there was an effect of baseline, and there was an effect of log molecular weight times C. Here it is here on the analysis of covariance. And in fact, viscosity was even a more linear and significant uh, effect. Viscosity, by the way, was measured by putting the cereals through a sort of uh, in vitro digestion system 
uh, and measuring the viscosity of the beta-glucan, which was solubilized. So what we've shown is that for modest doses of oat beta-glucan, 3 to 4 grams, a molecular weight of over 530,000 is effective in lowering LDL, and less than 210 is less effective or likely to be ineffective. So regarding objective one, the effective dose of bioactive oat beta-glucan, uh, lowering presbyterial glucose, we've shown 4 grams is effective, cholesterol, 3 grams, LDL. Bioactivity uh, on postprandial glucose and LDL depends on viscosity. The two factors which are important here are the concentration of the fiber in solution and its molecular weight. And concentration is determined by the dose fed and solubility.